Gyms are changing so much. If you have this ecosystem of 20 years ago, of 30 years ago, the, the Schwarzenegger gyms, the beginning of it all in a way, we are evolving towards a much bigger arena. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, I'm speaking with a professor and preeminent expert on future forecasting, trend watching, and innovation, who oversees a network of trend spotting cool hunters who troll major cities for the next big thing. He's sought out by some of the world's greatest brands, such as Adidas, BMW, and Sony, for his multifaceted expertise on consumer behaviors. In our interview, he offers a blueprint for building innovative, future-forward collaborations at the intersection of agile thinking and cutting-edge technology. You'll get a thought-provoking view at the unexpected future that awaits us as we discuss AI and the future of human capital in the workplace, the demographics and eco-trends set to transform the fitness industry, and the digital shifts in fitness being driven by ever-changing consumer expectations. So please welcome the founder of Science of the Time and the professor at the Shanghai Institute of Technology, Dr. Carl Roder, to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Dr. Professor Carl Roder, uh, welcome to the Escape Fitness uh, podcast. It's a, it's a pleasure. I, I hope it will become a pleasure. <laughs> So um, I've been, it's, a, it's an episode that I'm really excited about. And it, it's a subject that I guess I'm, I'm a little bit passionate about myself. We'd had a, an interview a couple of weeks ago, which um, where you challenged a lot of my thinking. And, um, and I, I, I thought as a bit of a, an introduction, I, I was very curious to, to know how do you become a professor of, of trend watching and innovation is is this this like a, a gift that you are certain people are born with or is it a skill that you've um you've developed over time well basically it has begun as a mix of a luck and coincidence like almost all things in life i was uh, 35 years ago i was a full academic and um I was at working worked at the University of Utrecht, and I was writing my dissertation on how the uh, mentality of the European Middle Ages transformed into the mentality of the Renaissance. So very historical, very academic. I loved it, and I was highly appreciated by about 35 people worldwide. Uh, but I loved it. And then my boss said, okay, if you now have a kind of model to describe how the Middle Ages are transforming qua mentality to uh, the Renaissance. Why don't you do this for this time in the future? And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's nice. And I said, and then I bring you from uh, to the department of uh, marketing, marketing communication. Uh, so then I became a cultural sociologist. This is how I started as a cultural sociologist. And uh, I started to predict from the contemporary culture What's going to happen in the next phase, future, future, future culture, future mentalities. And then, and this is 35 years ago, then slowly they uh, stopped mentioning me cultural sociologist, which I still am, uh, and they called me trend watcher, which was a little bit more vulgar than uh, a cultural sociologist, less academic, though I always held my position at universities, but it was also fun. It, you earn more money and you got invitation to go everywhere. So I've traveled a lot. So then I became a trend watcher, future forecaster. And uh, after some time I realized, well, they think I'm good and I do my work well and they invite me all over the world, but I'm only one guy. And then a big uh, company uh, uh, asked me, and that was really a change. Uh, they said, okay, you're a future forecaster trend watcher. So you know the trends, I say yes. Um, can you tell us what will be the trends in five years for girls 16 to 20 years in second tier cities in China? And then I said, well, I don't know. And then they said, well, you're a trend watcher. I thought, okay, there's a mistake. I, I, I work hard. I read a lot of books. I, I do a lot of interviews like I did the interview with you. Um, but I'm not a girl of 16 to 20 years old, not even when I was younger and I, uh, in China, second tier. So I must build a network and that's cool hunting. 
So basically since then, I hop from one university to another university with also companies. And uh, I, I say to the participants of the future forecasting research, which we now call uh, cool hunting, uh, I'm going to make you more trend sensitive and more innovation sensitive. How do we do that? This is your industry, it can be fitness, can be hospitality, can be luxury, can be uh, ICT, can be international business. We come with validated trends and you're going to cool hunt on those trends. You're going to hunt for tiny cool seeds of new developments inspired by the presentations we give. Um, and you're going to hunt, you find something, you're going to write a blog about it. All those blogs we put in one workspace. This is FUBU for you, by you, I tell uh, the cool hunters. Uh, and basically that works quite well. We started at the universities and um, uh, you go to a class. Uh, the good thing you have those cool hunters in front of you. You can, uh, you can inspire them. They go to blog. So it's education on the one hand because they learn a lot about validated trends. At the same time, at the end, you've done research as well because uh, next month, I'm going to do a hospitality uh, hunt, a cool hospitality hunt in Barcelona again at my EUHT uh, hotel school. 40 students, six days of trends, 40 times six is 240 blogs about the future, cool seeds of new developments with future growth potential. That's research. And not many people after two weeks working say, okay, we have a workspace open for everybody, for everybody who participated to see how those young, bright minds, inspired by validated trend presentations, watch the future and see the future. Then we analyze that and this kind of stuff, we are, it's part of my presentations, the brainstorms I'm doing and the workshops. So you mentioned the word validation and this was a, this was a bit that was particularly uh, interesting to me because I, I guess I'm, I'm talking on behalf of a business owner. We, we always are keen to be to try and spot the next trend and uh, what's relevant, what you know, what's what's right for your own business, but also the movements that you should start to be preparing for. Uh, and and I guess as entrepreneurs, we feel as though we've got this gut instinct, and sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. But one of the things I feel that you talk about and do differently is this validation. So can you just talk a little bit about what that is and, and how you think that that kind of gives probably a higher level of certainty in terms of some of these um, trends that you're identifying for the future? Yeah, well, the basic thing of which I'm proud and which I've worked pretty hard is I always say, I don't do it on my own. If you do it, whatever clever you are, and whatever many books you read and whatever great people you interview, you're only one guy. And either you're young or old, male, female, rich, poor, Chinese or Western. So if you say, hello, I can see the future, that's so stupid. Even if some people say fantastic things and I love to talk to them and I learn from them, but it's stupid because you are only a man, not a woman, rich, not poor, whatever. And uh, so I thought I must work with many people during the last decade in which uh, I, I worked, I made about 10,000 students from universities, uh, 54 universities, cool hunters. Uh, that doesn't mean that right now I have an army of 10,000 cool hunters because some cool hunters who gave it a try, I was very happy to say goodbye to after one uh, cool hunt. And, uh, and not all are very good if you have 10,000, but the very best all over the world, I keep close to my heart. And these are, of course, because they're good, it also means that they like cool hunting. We train them. We train them how to write the blogs. We tell them how to uh, write uh, convincing blogs that are uh, catchy, sexy, sticky, as we call them, and with uh, telling pics, with an inspiring title, with do good documentation. And if you have all those blogs together, uh, they rate and comment each other. And that rating is important. Suppose once again, uh, my forthcoming uh, hospitality hunt in uh, Barcelona, 240 cool seeds of new development, blocks about cool seeds of new developments. Uh, by the way, cool is not hip, painfully hip. That it's sometimes our definition when we work for Nike or for uh, Foot Locker. Uh, but generally speaking, it's attractive and inspiring with future growth potential. If you have 240 blocks, all 
telling you, look, this is a cool seat. This is an attractive and inspiring seat with future growth potential. Then, uh, well, then you have done a research. And then, of course, we have our methodological tricks. So uh, all the, the cool hunters themselves rate on each other's blocks. So in the end, you don't have 240 at random blocks about cool seats. You have a hit parade from one to 240. And they also comment on each other's cool seats. So they uh, have to come up with positive criticism. We, of course, we service and facilitate and accompany the whole uh, process, but that makes it more validated. If you don't do it on your own, if you do it in classes, it's somewhere between 20 and 50. As, uh, right now I'm doing a cool food hunt in the Netherlands with 100 uh, cool hunters. Um, then you're not alone. Then you are with a lot of people and young people, uh, all younger than me, believe me. Um, <laughs> and then you really have uh, yeah, a methodologically sane way of forecasting the future. Much better and much deeper than any person on his or her own can do. So this is, a, I guess it's a little bit of an aside to what we're talking to, but it's very relevant. Um, I did a, I didn't, I was in a seminar many years ago and we did this experiment where you had this, this is, it was a survival challenge where you had to cross a river. It was based on a military exercise and you did it on your own. And then you had a group of random people that weren't knowledgeable or skillful or had any previous experience and you had to do it together as a team. And then all the different groups in the room, you'd have to see how you did, who survived and who didn't. And I think the, the, in 90% in of the cases, the people that got together in, in a team uh, succeeded and survived as opposed to the people that did it on their own. So one of the things I guess I'm curious about in terms of your methodology, which seems as though there's this kind of group think um, in, in terms of solving a problem, is, is, is there a difference between a committee so you, you see a lot of um i guess local governments and that where they they have to get this sort of committee uh, uh together and they don't necessarily come out with anything great and innovative and forward thinking but but in, in some ways you kind of feel as though it's it's um it, it's it's a it's a poorer decision because of all the people that have to be involved in making the decision um but in, in, in your experience, is it a case of, well, look, regardless of the level, even even the sort of a, a team of average people are going to perform better than the individual trying to do this on their own? Like, let's talk about business and <coughs> dis deciding where to go. Or um, is it that you, you've really got to get a kind of high level team for that to be better than you working on your own? Uh to be honest, I discovered that working with a pool of diverse people, that's basically the best. Of course, if you can provide me with the 20 most brightest minds of this world, I definitely don't say no. But mixing my hospitality students from Barcelona, who, by the way, are pretty international, and, they're in, and, and delivering their insights to my Sao Paulo students or to my New York students or to my Amsterdam students or to my... Uh, New Delhi students or to the Shanghai students or Ho Chi Minh city, that's exciting because then you are automatically uh, invited to leave your own tunnel vision. And uh, we all have this tunnel vision. We must have a tunnel vision basically, but uh, I learn most from my Chinese students because they, they are so totally different. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things when you put uh, this is an experiment, not by me, but uh, by, by a scientist. When you put Western people and Asian people in front of an aquarium with fish, and afterwards you ask them, oh, what did you see? How did you use your 10 minutes watching fish in the aquarium? Uh, most Western people say, well, I, I took one fish and I follow that fish. Asian people say, well, I took a swarm of fish and I follow them. This says a lot about different cultures. Um, this says a lot about different cultures and, um, and the more diverse, the more you learn. To make a bridge, and uh, I, I, I want to be, be polite and friendly and I am, 
because I did now uh, 40, 45 interviews with thought leaders from the, uh, from the fitness industry like you. And it was fantastic in that sense that it was very open, welcoming, clever people. But one thing was disappointed, slightly disappointing. And once again, I loved it and I continue. Uh, they were all male. Almost all were male. High testosterone, high virility males. Very charming and even more competitive. And one kind of pool. Uh, I interviewed 40, I interviewed Mel Tempest. Uh, she was a great uh, gym chain leader in, in Australia. And Annie Felskach, same in Scandinavia. And some more. Um, but most of them are male. High testosterone males loving fitness. This is great, but it is not a diverse. No. No, that's right. Yeah, I, 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 um, I think that's a really interesting observation. And it's, it's one that um, certainly individual business owners probably need to acknowledge uh, from someone like yourself that's, that's, you know, really put this to the test. Um, and, and also industries in terms of solving problems. And um, it kind of leads me on to the, the next question I've had, where you, which is what you talk about, where it's, um, you, you, I'll, I'll try and get it right, but you talk about um, sharing brain power is in um in terms of co in, in terms of collaboration versus competition so could you talk a little bit a a about that and and you know how you sort of um you know what why why you why this sort of um collaboration and and contributing and sharing ideas even if you're not necessarily or even if you're in some cases competing against um a another person in some way yeah well you said uh, sharing uh brain power is in, I would say sharing brain po power is uh, very necessary and it's slowly getting in. And it doesn't help that much when uh, you have fantastic, intelligent males, high adrenaline males collaborating together. It's not the most easygoing uh, pool you can have, uh, but it is more necessary than ever because the gyms are changing so much. If you have this ecosystem of 20 years ago, of 30 years ago, the, the Schwarzenegger gyms, the beginning of it all in a way, we are evolving towards a much bigger arena. Of course, the gyms back then were all more or less the same, and now they have diversified very much from boutique to outdoors to uh, the apps. The, the, uh, uh, so it's, it's a much greater, a much broader arena, and we know it. And now we're going to a much, much more broad arena. Now in this arena where once in the middle was the traditional gym and that was put broader by the, the non-stationary uh, fitness possibilities, we all know and we, we, we've discussed. And now the circle, the arena, lots of very important new entities, new organizations are entering the arena. Government, for example, that's one. Government uh, who is uh, uh, realizing that fitness might not be uh, the problem, but it's part of the solution. So expect more interest, more interest uh, from uh, uh, governmental side to see, hey, hello, what are you doing? And then you must be prepared. And that means that you must collaborate to show the government how much you can offer. And to be honest, one of the thought leaders I spoke to, he said, well, actually, we were not so much uh, collaborating pre-corona or in the corona time to really convince uh, government that we doing a, did a great job. If back then we could have uh, joined all our statistical data, all our business data, of course, not all our business data, but relevant data to tell the to convincingly tell the governments who are now interested in the, in the bigger arena, hello, uh, this is what we can do. This is if people uh, do fitness, how more healthy they are, how probably they're boosting their immu immune systems. This is how we can fight workers' uh, absenteeism. If we could have delivered collaborating, these figures, we would have been a convincing conversation partner to the government. Now the government is entering the arena. Please share your knowledge where possible to show the government uh, that you are a fantastic partner. 
It's not only by the way the government is coming in, insurance companies are coming in. The wellness industry is coming in. The uh, uh, nutrition, uh, precision nutrition specialists are coming in. Sleep specialists are coming in. Uh, biohackers are coming in. So the arena will become huge and, uh, and more important and adult in a way. Until now, you had fantastic decades, but you're not an old business. You're not in the food that is all had, had a history of, of one and a half, a corporate history of one and a half dec- uh, centuries. And now you must make the next step. And their collaborating is more important than ever before. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. I, I sense that, well, I don't sense, it's, 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 you, you hear that the traditional fitness industry is certainly going through a change. You've got one side where you've discussed which big companies coming in, big tech companies, the government is expanding, medical, there's a lot of new players and they're growing the pie. And then as we spoke about on our conversation a week or so ago, there's the traditional manufacturers and some of the traditional fitness models that are really going through a tough time. I was reading one of the um, stories on your uh, website where it talks about how rust belts became smart belts. And I, and I thought that was quite relevant because oh, <laughs> you've got it in front of you. For those who have listened on audio, you've just, just held up a book. Okay, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, maybe you could just touch on some of those key lessons because just in, in terms of what happened there and, and how that shift was made because I think it, I think it's interesting for people who probably are feeling as though they're becoming a rust belt business and, um, and, and really want to become a smart belt. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, that's close to my heart right now. By the way, I'm talking about the big, big arena and you are saying the same as you call it a little, uh, more attractive by a growing pie. A big arena is a growing pie, but within this growing pie, you have to fight for your place. And the traditional gym will not be in the center. One way you can say the individual uh, fitness aficionado, the individual person who thinks I must do something with my health or my body or with my fitness, he, she will be in the middle. And there's a huge umbrella over your big pie or my big arena, and that will be a big tech, one way or the other. Um, so that's happening, that's, that's, uh, once again, your big uh, uh, pie and my big uh, arena. Um, if you go back to uh, Smartest Place on Earth, that's a fantastic study by um, Antoine van Achtmaal, who was at the World Bank and uh, friend Fred Bakker, a Dutch editor of the Dutch Financial Times several years ago. And uh, they went to the Rust Belts, so places who were once, uh, and maybe that is the traditional gym as well, though the analogies don't work all the way. Um, for example, they went to uh, Nokia, to, to the places where Nokia was manufacturing uh, their uh, mobiles after they broke. Or close to my home, in the, uh, I'm living in Amsterdam, Eindhoven, that was great in manufacturing cars in the 50s and 60s. Then they got broke in the 70s and the 80s. And then you had Rust Belts. And another Rust Belt in, in, uh, was, uh, was Seattle uh, 30, 30 years ago. Big industries, manufacturing industries, who, were, who had, uh, had lost their cool. Didn't compete for, with China, for example, lost uh, competition for China. So then you have an whole area with high unemployment with um, but with a lot of knowledge often also research centers and often also universities and either those uh, brain bells continue to go down the drain or you have a brain connector 
who brings them all together in Eindhoven, which is quite close by with some fantastic and charismatic leaders who say to the universities, to, uh, to research institutes, who got the best minds from the former manufacturing industry, saying, okay, we must work together and together we must decide what is a good future for Eindhoven. And now ASML, the chip producer, is leading the pack, not only Eindhoven, but worldwide. Uh, same in, in Seattle. Uh, Intel said, oh, said at a certain moment, we must have a place where we can store our, um, our data in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a earthquake safe environment, which became Seattle. Phil Knight, Nike was there. He's also a brain connector because he knew the government, he knew the universities, he has a decent amount of money. And he brought them together, and now it's one of the best places for life sciences. So Rust Belt, either they go down the drain, or with a sense of urgency, they realize we have to do better. We have to connect our universities, our research departments, the best people from uh, the Nokia and the, the other uh, uh, companies. We must bring it together. We must teach them, because it come, doesn't come natural, uh, to collaborate in this huge pie. Of course, then still you must re, uh, respect that companies have their own secret, secret, secret information. It's not a complete open world. We're still living under capitalism circumstances. But learning to share more in order to come from a, a, a rust belt into a smart belt, that's, it. that's key of, of the new developments. Not in the least because all the products we are making now, cars, that was once iron and, and, and rubber wheels. Now it's a uh, mobile full of wire, wired uh, devices. So this is, this is a bigger arena for cars. So you must come up with more players to collaborate. And it's are often authoritative, powerful uh, brain connectors provided with deep pockets who can uh, provide this, who can make this possible. Some similarities with, with uh, the, the fitness industry. You are, your, big, your arena is in, increasing, your pie is increasing. You have to learn to how to collaborate with AI, with algorithms, with uh, wellness, uh, with food, fantastic scientific food results, uh, fantastic uh, scientific food uh, people who know so much. One of the things I learned from, from the industry, because these are very clever, smart people, they say, we have to integrate the scientific knowledge better into our actual practices and our knowledge. We say we do, but it can be much better. So this is what is relevant from the, the book about Rust Belt to Smart Belts for Fitness. Often it only becomes realizable and it only uh, happens when there is a sense of urgency. If Eindhoven, for example, in the 80s was a, a lost city, lots of uh, people who were uh, without work, and they said, we must change that. So there must be a sense of urgency. And I'm not completely convinced if, all, uh, if the fitness industry has this sense of urgency because you're doing quite well. <laughs> you're back. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of people are back. Uh, new people coming, basically flocking to the, the good old gyms saying, hello, uh, work on my immune system. New people, older people, they all say, well, I, I have to do something. So on the one hand, it's, it goes fantastic with the industry. And, uh, and that's true, but behind uh, what's happening uh, and behind the success is this danger of becoming, uh, of, of getting kicked out of the hub as a gym, at the center of the hub, at the center of your pie, at the center of my arena, simply because other players will take over. Apple, for example. Yeah, uh, so I think that's the one that's that... danger. And another thing, what 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 makes the uh, uh, the industry a little bit more humble than they actually appear? Yes, it's a great success. There come so many new people to the gyms, but retention—that's the dirty little secret of the industry. That's low. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's a fantastic story. The urgency, the sense of urgency that we really have to collaborate more to stay in tune with this bigger pie. Um, that sense of urgency is less uh, 
present than it was in Eindhoven or in Seattle or in Nokia. Nokia is the same story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, it's, it's a nice transition to my next question, Carl. And and um, th this was something I read uh, on your, again, one of your blogs that got me really excited. And and it was so off the wall, uh, what it, from, from my mind anyway, that I thought, well, how could the what what could we learn from this as it, as it relates to the to the fitness industry and 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 how and why do they work and and so a couple of examples that I'll mention I'd like love you to expand on but the first one is the wang in it idea with uh, Vera Wang and McDonald's which was totally a huge contrast if if you look at it and and then the other one was was Louis Vuitton in the in the gaming space uh, and both sort of very very different stories but it, it kind of really I suppose what it did for me was to kind of expand my thinking massively and say well what what interesting collaborations could there be in in this fitness space as opposed to trying to collaborate with apple which everybody looks to say well apple are the big players let's think about how we could collaborate them maybe there's other very interesting businesses that are totally left field that have something similar and i'd be interested to uh, to learn from you what what those potential similarities are to find some what I would call like these weird collaborations that could, um, you know, have quite a quite a, a big effect to your business. Well, first of all, those weird collaborations are not really weird. Uh, those companies have thought very cleverly. Uh, what do my customers like? And these customers are uh, uh, the younger millennials, basically, so 17, 30 years old. This is a new group, especially in fashion and luxury. And you mentioned fashion and luxury brands. And uh, Dolce & Gabbana is working with Smack. Smack is a, a, a furniture, a kitchen furniture. Uh, so we have very uh, unexpected. Uh, Louis Vuitton is working with Supreme, both fashion, but Louis Vuitton is high, high end and Supreme is street. Um, but there's a, great, a very good reason behind it, because those millennial groups, the younger millennials, they love to be surprised. At Instagram, they love to be surprised with beautiful visuals. Um, we have several paradigms, soft spots for uh, millennials we're working with. I'm, I've done research with them during the last 10 years with 10,000 of them. So I pretend to know a bit of them. And we have their soft spots. Uh, and one of them is don't be boring. Life is too short for boring stuff. I'm totally excited by everything I see in, in the visual world. So uh, makes life unexpected to me. Have have some guts, and it's and also please collaborate. This is a generation. This is born post super individualism. Individualism. They they the the, the 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 power of collaboration, the sharing economy. You can doubt it. You can criticize it, but it is a topic and a theme, a lived through lifestyle theme for a lot of millennials. So uh, let's collaborate. Don't be boring. If you mix them together, then the idea of uh, Louis Vuitton working with some street, famous street brand, makes sense. And then, and that's the third soft spot, publish it on Instagram. Life is Insta should be Instagrammable. Otherwise, if it's not on Instagram, it, it isn't there. So don't be boring. Collaborate in exciting, in exciting ways and uh, Put it on Instagram. These are three soft spots of uh, the younger millennials. Two more, just to uh, to make my story complete. Um, I'm depressed. It's not a happy uh, generation, which is a good reason to get them into um, into uh, the fitness industry and the fitness and mental wellness uh, in industry. And the last one is uh, give me purpose. Give me hmm. social responsible. Uh, companies. Mm. In, in terms of the stickiness of the idea, like when I when I saw that, just just the visual. So you mentioned visuals. Just the visual itself, kind of it almost like slapped me around the side of the head and like, what am I looking at? Because you would you would instinctively think maybe if McDonald's did a collaboration with Ford Motor Car, that would probably make sense. And and there's there's other ones of that sort of ilk. But it, it just seemed to to also be a stark contrast in in brands and what would be seemingly the, a, a, an audience um in terms of particularly in mcdonald's how mcdonald's would would position themselves and then vera wang in, as well it's almost like well 
why would they kind of associate themselves with something like a, a, a low price kind of seemingly a low income fast food but it, it just it kind of gives them both this I don't know a, 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 some something different the, yeah. but just that it just gives them this magic together which I thought was so clever really yeah actually uh, uh, your amazement or your oh wow what's happening here uh, you, I, I can see you I know in the podcast you can see but you look great and you look very Cal Californian tanned um, <laughs> but you also is betraying that you're not 21 anymore Matthew uh, so it's probably oh, these, are, <laughs> these are such weird combination it's slightly too weird for me to expect but uh, in this weird, more fluid world of uh, the TikTok, Instagram, pick and mix generation that we all now call either Generation Z or young millennials, uh, you, you don't surprise them when McDonald does something with a brand you and definitely me are associating them with. That's, that's mm -hmm. nice. It's uh, middle of the road, as you can expect from big brand strategies. Uh, functioning. That's not exciting. That's not, uh, that is that is rather boring. We've seen it, we've done it, and it still can be nice if there's something in it for us, but it's sexy, catchy, sticky, unexpected collaborations within fitness. I like uh, Lululemon pretty much. They, they uh, sell uh, sportswear, but now in, in their flagships, uh, that was from uh, Cool Hunter, so uh, maybe I don't tell it exactly really correct uh, cor correctly but i didn't know i do come to tell that so this is a sports wear athletics uh, uh, shop now bringing mindfulness in bringing yoga in actually starting healthy food classes so this is an experience and we live on the design of experience economy of course but we know that but every year experience economy shows different things um, but it's also a tiny arena in a shop Oh, they bring in so many interesting partners, and that comes natural to uh, young millennials. Mm. Well, I think it's a lesson. It's a great lesson to to challenge yourself to think out of the box, because I suppose you can think from a brand perspective and a collaboration perspective. You 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 could put a bunch of stuff on the table, and and you kind of get a similar thing. And I guess it echoes to the earlier part of a conversation where you you were talking about having sort of young Chinese people contributing to something. I think having that diversity w means that you come up with collaborations and scenarios and relationships that you would just never have imagined um, on on your own. And suddenly it's like, well, that's weird, but there's something there that really resonates and and, and is, is probably going to work just because of its sort of unusualness. I, for me, that's a massive takeaway. No, yeah, I, uh, I, re I realize now because uh, one of the reasons why we're talking is that we're going to set up this international cool fitness and health fund. Um, uh, suppose we could get from all over the world, or maybe that's too ambitious, from a substantial part of the world, 100 cool fitness and health hunters and asking them, because they will be younger, everybody can subscribe, of course, but I guess there will be more 20-somethings and 60-somethings, 60 so you never can tell. And ask them, uh, come up with uh, unexpected, unboring, Instagrammable um, collaborations for a gym, for a chain, uh, for the whole industry. That would be pretty cool to see with what kind of collaborations they come up with me uh, as a non 21 years old person and you as a non 20 year old person can come up with. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. I'd love to love to know more about that if, if that comes off. Uh, building, building on that sort of, I guess, um, what's the word, un unusual unexpectedness. Um, I'd like to go on to eco trends because there's a lot of talk about that. There's a lot of companies thinking about that space, not not as much in the fitness industry, I wouldn't say, but I, th I think it's something probably that they need to kind of think about. And there was two examples I, I read uh, about on on your website. One one was um, out of date beer turning into gin, which was which was an interesting story. There was another one which was uh, reusable bottles creating a, a a floating hotel. So again, two. A couple of very sort of strange things coming together to create um, a unique business. Um, what what are 
I, I suppose, why, why do you think these were particularly interesting and relevant? And, and where could some of those ideas relate into the fitness industry, specifically e e eco trends and um, if, that's, if that's the correct terminology, and then the, the sort of interesting collaborations that we could potentially think about in, in that particular space? Well, uh, several things. First of all, sustainability is a big issue all around the world. Uh, climate change denier, de deniers are pretty silent right now all over the world. Um, and it's one of the key soft spots for uh, Generation Z, Generation Z. We did a lifestyle documentation uh, projects with them here in the Netherlands and in China. And both are into uh, very much into uh, sustainability. And that's for a good reason. They have to live longer on this burning planet than, uh, than, mm -hmm. than older generations. The ultimate hero in the West, when it comes to sustainability is greater, for the younger people is Greta Thunberg. The Swedish a slightly autistic, fantastic girl who's fighting, uh, well, you, you know her. Uh, so this, this says something, you have to be sustainable. At the same time, this generation doesn't trust companies that much. There's a lot of green eco-washing all hotels, for example, say, yes, we are green right now because we offer you the possibilities uh, not to change your towel every day, which is nice. <laughs> this is quite indeed, uh, it saves energy, but it's also in the interest of the hotel. It would be more reasonable, it would be more collaborative, to use the term again, and say, okay, if you, ch if you don't change your towel for a week, you get a slight discount. That's the way of thinking of uh, millennials, and by the way, also my way of thinking. Uh, so that's one. Uh, eco greenwashing, uh, those millennials are clever, they are born on the internet, they have a decent amount of distrust for a lot of reasons, uh, so everybody will get outed one way or the other. If you don't walk the talk, you are in danger and you will get a more, well you have already your uh, fashion for example, was burning all, of putting all the fantastic clothes of last year in landfills or burning them. Burberry got punished for that on the social media. That's what all industries, when it comes to Generation Z, Z and uh, young millennials have to reckon with. If you go to the fitness industry, uh, for within the fitness industry, it's a not so urgent topics, topic compared to other industries. Car industry, hospitality is busy now. Food, by the way. Plastic waste, for example. Um, and probably that comes because the industry says, hello, we're doing fine. And we are adding already so much to the biggest problems in this world. We are the solution to health problems. Great. So we are without danger. That's very much true. And you're doing fine and you're offering a lot. I love the industry and I'm a passionate uh, fitness uh, player as well. Um, so you do great with health. And nobody will notice that you're not that big on sustainability until they notice. And mm -hmm. it will be a knockout, especially because it's unexpected. And take, for example, uh, equipment. The normal procedure with equipment is uh, the equipment producer brings it to the gym and sincerely hopes and put a serious effort to get it out of the gym for, an, for the next generation equipment in five, six years. Great. And nobody's that much interested. What do you do with this? Do you throw it away? Will it be put in a landfill? Do you deconstruct, de deconstruct it? Nobody is caring about that issue that much right now. And uh, we don't care until we stop, care, uh, stop with not caring. And then, uh, then you're all of a sudden in the middle of a social media criticism stream, like Burberry and their landfills of great fashion of last year as discovered, I think, two, three years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. I, I know probably one of the first companies I've seen, I'm, I'm sure there's more that I'm not aware of, but um, I saw recently Gold's Gym where they're trying to create in, in terms of, uh, and I don't know what it, what it means, but uh, uh, one of these sort of green energy facilities in, in one of their headquarters in, in Germany. So I, I think they're one of the first chains that are at least addressing some of those concerns. Not to what level I'm, I'm not sure but I, I just think it's probably we're seeing it a lot in a lot of other industries and um, and I think you're right it's some, something we also need to be aware of in terms of the equipment that's being made a lot of it is is a lot of plastics and things that are not easy to uh, to destroy and 
um, some of the strange ideas like recycled bottles or materials that, that could be used um, may be of value for operators at, at some point in the future, potentially. Well, I think your example of, uh, of the German uh, gym, that's totally cool. And it's a very cool beginning. If you are the first, it, uh, you have a chance that it will be picked up, especially by this younger generation, and give your brand a boost. This is the first purposed, eco, seriously eco-friendly gym. It's a big challenge, and it's not easy, but hello, it's a big challenge for food and for fashion and for automotive as well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty important. And uh, within now and a decade, I guess all industries will get outed, mm. including the government who will entering the big arena uh, together with insurance companies and all the others. They, so it will become an issue. So I, I want to talk about the, the sort of digital versus physical experience. So we're seeing certainly COVID's accelerated that. I know you spoke about it in your recent, uh, one of your recent talks with, uh, the, um, with, with, on, with FIBO. Um, and a lot of people are obviously concerned about that, where it will go, uh, will people desert gyms, will they come back? Um, but one of, the, one of the things I read about, uh, again, on your website, which I recommend people checking out because there's some great stuff on there, and, and stick, me, stick with me on this one because there is a, I believe there is a connection, but you, you talk about the evolution of, of, the, of the sex industry and, um, and sort of the, the, there, was, there was some examples of, of where people were even, um, um, that people wanted to connect with each other. There's this physical thing where people were charging for a hug in New York and, and, and some other examples. And, and so I'm just wondering, with all this sort of digital people sitting behind the screens, being isolated, in contrast to the need for more collaboration, do you think that these, um, or, or what, what, what experiences do you think people will eventually seek in the next five to 10 years? And is, is there a correlation between what you're seeing in other industries, such as this, you know, this, the sex industry, where th there's this just need for connection as opposed to the sort of isolation that you are getting with a lot of these digital products uh, at the moment? Uh, well, for a sideline, but uh, not an interesting sideline. If you want to learn as effectively and efficiently as possible what uh, big tech and artificial intelligence and algorithms can do, then uh, do some interviews with the sex industry or with the, with the porn industry, the adult, uh, adult industry. This is, uh, I, I just read in the Financial Times today that every day, uh, a third of a billion people are watching porn. And, and those porn sites, huge as they are, are knowing exactly what you're clicking on and what you're doing and what you like. So there's no brands more sophisticated when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence uh, than the sex industry. I don't want to imply that you should work together with the sex industry, or the, but it is an interesting group when it comes to understanding artificial intelligence, but this is a sideline, okay? Um, the question was, uh, oh, the physical, and, and the, uh, that's interesting. A few months ago, now things are open in the West, so we know. Uh, the big question was, all those people who have learned to embrace the Pelotons, who have done uh, exercises, on online exercises, often by the very best celebrity fitness trainers, they are available worldwide. All those people who discovered outdoors, will they come back? Now we know more because, and the figures are good. Yes, most of them are coming back. Though I don't know if you can trust the figures total, totally, but uh, generally speaking, a lot of come back. New people are entering as well. Uh, the, the people say, Let, please help me to work on my immune system. Uh, everybody has got, uh, ex of, a lot of people have got an extra weight on the couch watching Netflix. So, uh, and, and Amazon, by the way. And, uh, and they all go, so it's uh, the love of social is huge. We all have been, we, it was a lonely year for all of us. Uh, so meeting people is uh, a huge desire and it is exploding right now. Last week I started my cool food hunt with a Dutch university close by. 
And for the first time after a year, the students were in the same room, 75 of them and five teachers. And everybody was exhilarating. We were so happy to see each other. I was even happy because for the first time, if you talk to a, a group of uh, well, about 100 uh, cool food hunters, you must shout a bit because it is not necessary for an online uh, meeting, but in class you have to shout a bit. I even love the shouting. So it was a very uplifting experience for all of us. So the social, the new social is the one of the great things, one of the inconquerable things of, of inconvincible things of uh, the gym. However, more groups are coming to the gym. New groups are coming to the gym. New groups that might not have the traditional fitness DNA like you have it and I pretend to also have a little bit. Uh, people who feel scared, people who feel intimidated, people uh, who uh, want to be left alone, maybe because they feel scared and intimidated, maybe uh, because that's simply in their nature, the earbud young ones, we call them. So uh, yes, it's a great characteristic and a great proposition of the traditional gyms. Um, we are social, especially the family uh, uh, fitness chains. They are doing great uh, and they are very social. But at the same time, we see a re redefinition of social. On the one hand, new groups, and it's about time that you go to serve them because there's a lot of money in those new groups. Um, can you serve them in the same way? not only on the machines, because they have not a DNA which is really embracing fitness, otherwise they have, would have been there before. Uh, okay, uh, but maybe they want to have another social. Peloton, my, you can, when you re redefine social, Peloton is pretty social as well, in a new way. And nobody knows, this was also would be a fantastic research theme for an international cool fitness and health fund, how do you define social? What is the most social experience when you were exercising or uh, during uh, the last uh, month, write a blog about it and let's compare, let's compare these blogs, let's discuss these blogs. And maybe not only what is your most social experience during exercising, but what was your most social experience which you enjoyed most during the last month? I guess you can learn a lot of them, not only of, out of these kind of blocks, not only uh, because they broaden your perspective, but also because uh, maybe the new, the redefinition of social is different in Brazil, in, in, in your place, California, or my place, Amsterdam. And then there's China and social. So I, I think that was the bit that I was trying to uh, understand as it, as it relates to one of the posts I was reading is, is you've kind of got connection, but then you've got human human touch, human interaction, uh, because that's also something, even shaking a hand, having a hug. Uh, some, so yes, you, you, Peloton have done an awesome job at creating community and connection in a virtual space, but it, it'll be interesting, and I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on it, is, is does that, um, can that be achieved successfully on a virtual basis, or is there something in the human touch, the human proximity that, that we as humans really strive for in an experience. I, I, I fully agree. This, this deeply human contact from human to human, face to face, or body to body, or exercising together is a, a fantastic um, proposition of all classical or traditional gyms. So no doubt about it. It's deeply, we are deeply, deeply, deeply social human beings. Uh, so, but that's not, I, I want to say that, and, but I don't want to, to use that sentence, which is very true and I believe it, as a kind of tranquilizer for the fitness gym. So we don't have to do anything. They will come because they are deeply, deeply social which, and human, which is true. But one of the thought leaders, uh, Guy Villes, who is, is the editor, the head, uh, main editor of uh, El Mercado, which is uh, the leading fitness magazine, fitness and health magazine in Brazil, not in Brazil, but the whole of Latin America, said uh, this human contact can be intensified, can be uh, empowered, can be facilitated by technology. Human, uh, humans empowered by technology. That's also possible. 
And other thought leaders says, yeah, okay, we are very human, we are very social, uh, but uh, it becomes when a personal trader knows your name and knows, spell your name correctly and give you a towel at the right moment, that's still not such a deep indication of what social means. If, uh, and that will come with augmented reality, if the, 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 uh, the, the, the lady or the, the, the guy at the center sees you and immediately recognizes you, oh, this is this, he is, he, has, he is a member of our club for so long and he is decreasing his visits or he is increasing his visits or he is watching websites on uh, f- losing foot weight. That's also humanity and social, but empowered by technology. So talking about humans then um, and technology, uh, my question that I was it's an interesting one because I've read about it and it's something that's talked about quite quite a lot as well which is and you, you, I think you use the term humans are underrated and I suppose if you look at technology and AI one of the things that people generally thought that it was going to remove a lot of the low paid basic mundane jobs and and people were going to the, the, the jobs that were going to be around were more in the sort of higher level what's certainly happened as a result of, of COVID and, and certainly technology and AI don't seem to have any kind of solution to this is, is a lot of the jobs that have disappeared and people are really struggling with are a lot more of those lower paid service type of jobs that are, are, are people, I think people certainly in the UK and America, those are two markets that we are involved with and recruiting people with there's, there's just a huge shortage of people and and so i'm just i i guess just interested in your thoughts on that is technology gonna suddenly get rid of a huge part of a workforce or have we actually realized that a lot of this work is is very very important it's quite difficult to replace it with technology or, or ai and we may need to sort of reconsider the importance of people and um within the sort of the the the, the sort of business ecosystem there are two fantastic books about the subject and by the way on the website i've written a a booklet about the future of work and it is available on the website www.signsofthetime.com and um there are two great books one is called um humans are underrated you mentioned it another book is uh, human uh, humans don't need to apply Humans don't need to apply, says, uh, because AI and algorithms take over. Every task that is regular and have, has a routine runs the danger of get, taking, uh, being taken over by machines, by algorithms, by, uh, by uh, software devices. Every task that is routine, we always thought that it was only the manual task. So if, now we have the uh, the... the the factories where all the simple manual tasks are automatized away. It also counts for simple routine mental tasks. So uh, fiscal administrators uh, are in danger as well. So this is the, the point of uh, humans don't need to apply because these everything that is has routine in it can be taken over by clever algorithms. On the other hand, uh, humans are underrated because there are something, there are some things that actually right now machines cannot take over. And that's everything that is not routine. That's everything that has to do with creativity. That's everything that has to do with emotional intelligence. That's everything that has to do with empathy. One of the reasons why I'm so happy to be a professor in future forecasting in hospitalities is that's where the empathy is. That's where the emotional intelligence is. So uh, uh, when you when you translate it to the fitness universe, you see a kind of divide. The the the, the basic low cost fitness clubs who will get more and more automatized because it's low cost and machines. Are never ill. They never fight with uh, their wives or husbands. Uh, they uh, uh, they never drink too much. So that's a great business model. If you don't want that, uh, or if you have more money or both, then you have a booming boutique. 
uh, industry where a trainer, a good trainer knows a lot about the physical aspects of exercising and the foot aspects of exercising, but his key function is keeping you motivated and making your time next to him, her as pleasant as possible. I am, I have three different personal trainers in the most fantastic, perfect training um, fitness club in Tilburg, close to uh, Amsterdam. And uh, when I went there after three months, uh, I could do all, uh, I have arthros, so I have to be careful with my body. So I'm routine uh, fitness exerciser and I could do them all myself. But these highly emotional, empathic guys and girl, they totally have packed me in. I think that's a verse English, but I was totally seduced by them. I needed them next to me. And sometimes I go to other gyms, for example, those high tech gyms, very cheap, uh, uh, have everything monitored, but I, I, I immediately go back to my personal trainers and say, I can't, I can't lift one leg without a personal trainer sitting next to me or standing next to me saying that I'm doing great. And, and I think that's the that's the sort of just to jump in there for a second. I, th I think that's the interesting thing because you, you have got certain jobs historically, certain prior to COVID that were also people thought, well, that's not important. We don't need that. But I, maybe it is just in terms of timing where we are in the world and we appreciate in connection community and just having someone to chat to even if it's the receptionist where you could argue well do you need a receptionist or can people just swipe in on their own and they don't need one but i suppose if you have been in isolation for a long time then then those mundane jobs are not just it's not just about swiping in it's it's the relationship it's the friendly smile it's the human connection it's oh you know how's your how's your dog um kind of things that, that you just can't um, you can't easily replace. And I suppose when I'm listening to what you're saying, it, it, is it a case of where you'll have your sort of lower price, which will be delivered to you by a robot, a computer, some sort of AI, and then your more premium experience, you will get a real human that has empathy and connection yeah. and, and, and that sort Actually, of thing. Actually, I did with my hospitality students, but also with my uh, fitness uh, cool hunters. And it was a tiny cool hunt. Um, I asked them, what is the most human touch points you've met in a fitness club or in, in a hotel. It's also interesting because if you do it per generation, you get different outcomes. And in China, it will be different from Brazil, from right. uh, the USA. Hmm. Uh, but may I tell you one, uh, uh, well, one bad example and a good example. Uh, I'm now uh, 60. When I was in my 50s, I said to my best uh, female friend, Colette, I said, listen, now it's time. We have to go to, uh, we, have, we have to start doing fitness. You are getting fat. I said more politely, but it was the truth. Uh, me too. So let's go. And her answer was, yes, I go. You have great. And let's do it together because that works better. So we do it. But first I have to lose weight. <laughs> and now we are 10 years later and she's still losing weight. That's the opposite of a great experience. Mm -hmm. My own personal trainer, I'm training in a fantastic uh, club with and some of people who are training for the Olympics are there too, of those, yeah, this godlike human bodies. <clears throat> and they're all very friendly. We train in a kind of behind some curtains, of course, the curtains are not compl completely closed. And um, uh, so I, I heard them training three, never more, four maybe. And then I once had to go to the toilet, so I and I was tired from, from uh, exercising. I was pretty proud of what I've done. I went to the toilet and so I saw these other guys training uh, in their 20s. They could hang with one toe on the ceiling, at least that was it looked to me. So I was totally impressed. I went back to my personal trainer and I was a bit infantile because I'd worked hard. I said, do you like it with me as well? If I see these guys, I never can do this exercises, I'm a total loser. Do you like training me as well? And then he must show his emotional intelligence, I realized. Of course, he couldn't say, no, I don't like it with you, but you pay money. That's the horrible answer. But he said, well, listen, uh, it's right, you will never get to the Olympics. Well, let's see, yeah, you have to face reality. But these guys are training from 95% to 98% of the performance level. You were going from 25 in one year to 65. That was such a relieving answer to me. I thought, oh, wow, I'm making 40% points and they only three. I'm the winner. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the power of understanding where I was standing as an older guy with a non-perfect body and giving the right answer. Yeah, great example. So I've got a couple of questions relating to that that I'd like to ask before we, we wrap up, Carl. But before that, could you share with the listeners where people can find more about you, what you're doing, your websites, any, any places that they can connect with you or any, um, you know, any, any sort of opportunities to hear you, hear you speak? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, well, first, let's mention the website, scienceofthetime.com science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, science, academic, scienceofthetime.com. There you can find a lot. And there's one click, by the way, on uh, start, we're starting up the International Cool Fitness and Health Hunt. If you're interested in it, please have a look. Uh, actually, uh, this will be an International Cool Fitness and Health Hunt, independent from any university. So we are starting to recruit people who want to join uh, and have to pay a decent kind of price because it's work and we have to well we have we can't do it for free um, so that's uh, what we are talking about i told you already what how do we do cool hunting training people to become more trend sensitive and more innovation sensitive but also con more training them in more convincingly writing sexy catchy sticky telling pigs and while well, we have the whole methodology right so everybody who wants to join, uh, very, very welcome. Please have a look. Yeah, well, I'm a professor of future forecasting innovation. During the last 10 years, I, uh, I've been a professor in Barcelona hospitality because that empathy piece, that emotional intelligence piece, is, that hospitality piece is most developed there. Uh, in Amsterdam, of, uh, close to Amsterdam, Tilburg, where we set up a future forecasting and innovation department at the Uni Fontes Universities. And... I think it was 2012, the, uh, the municipality of Shanghai uh, made me the first future forecasting professor in, at Shanghai Institute of Technology. So it's always future forecasting. I love it. We have this cool methodology and we love to extend to everybody who says, oh, I'm, I have the ambition to understand trends better, to become more trend sensitive, more innovation sensitive. Well, you're invited to at least visit the website, scienceofthetime.com. And we'll put the links in the show notes and on YouTube and wherever people are listening to it so they can click on that and, and find you, Carl. Obviously, we appreciate. Demographic opportunities. You gave a great example, actually, about going to a, a club and you were more in the mature category and there was a lot of younger people that were athletes, very, very different level. And I suppose that in... The industry we talk a lot and, and you have mentioned it as well about the millennials that seems to be where a lot of the focus is and people are trying to tap into that because i guess it's a big opportunity but in terms of other opportunities do, do we do we kind of look at other demographics in isolation boomers for example i know there's a lot of stuff in from a medical perspective and longevity perspective which is pretty interesting and it certainly has a a link into fitness wealth and and um that that kind of category or do we do we think about it differently and in in the, in the case of the location you go to where it, it's 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 looking at some of the common themes uh, all those demographics have and um in terms of trying to go from 20 percent to 40 percent or whatever do, do we do we look at it in in that perspective so what, what's your views on on some of the future opportunities in terms of the, the the demographics that we talk to or try and go yeah. after yeah well the, my view was rather kaleidoscopical in this because the fantastic news is thanks to covid which is not a very pretty thing of course uh, so many people are realizing i have to do more regarding my health i have to be more responsible regarding my health um how long that will take when COVID fades away, maybe that, that new health consciousness is uh, fading out a bit, but not completely. And there are so many different people. They are not all, uh, all the people who have gained weight, uh, which is almost everybody, uh, have a new urgency, uh, the older generation, but actually everybody says, says, oh, can I work better on my immune system? Uh, so basically, all the thought leaders I'm talking to said, yes, there we see, we now have to appeal 
to people who are not like us, to people who are uh, not uh, saying uh, exercising is great, uh, to people who uh, don't like the pain of exercising. Uh, and these are a lot of different groups. On the one hand, you can try to uh, cater them all. Uh, that's uh, uh, when I, I'm, I'm living uh, on the other side of my street is a low budget uh, fitness club and I see everybody going in. It's low cost, let's give it a try. I see them also going out, by the way. So that's a retention problem uh, of a challenge. But yes, there are a lot of groups, health people who are more focused on health, on immune, on, on the general boost. As long as, uh, and that's on the way, the, the, the Schwarzenegger fetishism, some of thought leaders call it. Uh, so not the, the group that is really going there to make uh, fantastic Schwarzenegger fascist, fascist fetishism pictures of themselves is diminishing. And that's good because all the other groups who are not aiming to become the next uh, Schwarzenegger uh, are receiving lower thresholds to get into the gyms. So basically, it's a great time for the whole industry, uh, but they must reckon with a bigger arena, with the huge players who wants to have a piece of this increasing, growing pie, uh, and lots of new uh, customers coming in, but they are not like you. They have different DNA. They are not the people who have a natural a uh, link, a natural as association, a natural liking for uh, the fitness gyms as we know them. Excellent. My final question then, Carl, and this is one I ask at the end of all my podcasts, but I'm going to do it in a different way this time, just for, just for you. Uh, because Thank you so much. This is, so much. This is a, customization. <laughs> this is <laughs> customization, personalization. So the, the question normally goes, escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. And then I ask the guest, how have they escaped their personal limits? But I'd like to make a slight twist and say, as, a, as people that are operating in this arena that we've just spoke about, what a, what a, I guess, one of the things that we can do as, as individuals to escape our personal mental limits in terms of how the lens that we're looking at our industry through. And you've given some great examples, but my guess, I know you did this to me, you, you challenged my thinking and you, you certainly pushed me to do probably three or four more reps than what I would have normally done in my questioning. But how, how could we as individuals escape our mental limits in terms of, you know, the way we're looking at things at the moment and, and, and come up with some new solutions that haven't yet been imagined. May I start with myself? Please do. Um, because then I have the answer. Uh, I, 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 I love fitness. I, I've, I've seen what it's done with my health, with my breathing capacities, with my lungs, with my heart. So, um, and I, I'm totally fond of my three personal trainers, but I would love to, uh, so I'm, I'm a very happy person, but please give me my virtual skin. And with the virtual skin, I mean at least give me the tracking monitor devices who really meticulously in detail track everything. What's happening in my bowels? You have your brains in your head, you have your second brains in your bowels. Uh, if you eat a tomato and I eat a tomato, it's good for, it's healthy for the both of us, but it does a different thing with my bowels and your bowels. You, your emotional brains are in your bowels. Let me know how it works in detail for me. Um, so, and, and also my mental health, I'm pretty healthy. My sleeping patterns, what does it mean? You have now this pretty decent hit. All my students are busy with it. Micro dosing. You know what it is? It's about uh, not uh, uh, taking tiny uh, portions of what makes you totally high or hallucinating. So only one hundredth of it. It changes a lot in your mental landscape, in your mental performances. Uh, several of my students, this is the Netherlands, are very into that, but I guess that's the same in California. So they are experimenting with it. They don't have the tools to really monitor it. I would love to experiment with it, just to ex explore my possibilities uh, at a tender age of over 60. 
but everything I read on the internet is for young people <laughs> and my producing. I want to explore and mo by monitoring what's in my body and in my bowel and in my mind and uh, uh, far more meticulously than is possible right now. Seamless, all the ads and devices seamless working together when I start on a fitness machine or when I'm sleeping in my bed or when I'm having a, a microdose, it's still not there. And that would really uh, surpass my limits or escape my limits. Is this an answer that you want? This is a great answer. And um, Carl, I really, I, I, I enjoyed talking to you because you, you certainly helped me think and escape my own mental limits. I, I hope this is has inspired uh, anyone that's listening to this to, to kind of re-look at things, even if they're going through a, a, an interesting or challenging time. And uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to sort of uh, meet you again when we, when we start traveling. I'd love to come over to Amsterdam and maybe we can try that microdosing together and see what we come up with. <laughs> well, let's wait and see. And uh, I hope to come back to you when we do this International Cool Fitness and Health Hunt. We will get fantastic results, I hope. And very intercultural as well. So, uh, and uh, if I can interview you, then and you interview me, then uh, we have a nice future wherever on this globe. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Carl. Nice meeting you again. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.